So you design a digital circuit or a digital system and you want to implement it in, on an FPGA. So how do you do that? Well, you need some sort of a CAD tool or computer aided design tool, which is just a specialized piece of software that will help you um, just translate your code into something that we can put on the board. And as it turns out, there are a few CAD tools or softwares available to do that, depending on the manufacturer. So Xilinx produces, Vivado, Intel produces, Quartus Prime, Mentor Graphics um, produces Model Sim Precision, Microsemi produces Libero. Uh, by the way, Microsemi is a, is a third big player in, in the FPGA, but Xilinx and Intel are the major ones. Because we are using Xilinx um, FPGA, we will be using Vivado and I'll be sh going through an example of what's happening in Vivado and we'll be using it throughout the semester. But what I want you to know is all CAD tools that pretty much perform the same functionality. So let's jump into figuring out what do they do. Well, in here, I'm showing you a flow chart of a generic CAD tool. All of the CAD tools have like some sort of a version of this particular flow chart. But in short, what you do is first you design your circuit. So you have your design you have everything. And now you want to input it into that software. So instead of me just walking you through this flow chart, I decided that I just will show you um, how do we do it in Vivado itself. So I'm going to open Vivado in here and I'm going to show you an example. The example on how I designed it and the code and whatnot doesn't matter for now. What I'm going to show you is just a, um, a, a multiplexer circuit, the 2 one, two one multiplexer. I don't want you to worry about the code or anything. I just, I'm going to walk you through the steps of what the CAD tool is doing at this point. Okay, so we figured out the design. We figured out that we're implementing a multiplexer. So I'm just going to write here, I am implementing a MUX. I know that I'm implementing a multiplexer, which is specifically a two to one multiplexer. Okay, so how do I go about it? Well, the very first step, um, according to this diagram, is actually design entry. You need to enter that design into your CAD tool. So, okay, and there's a couple of ways to do it. There's a schematic capture and there's actually a Verilog. So let's talk a little bit about the schematic capture. So the schematic capture in here, let me just do that. Okay, schematic capture. So I can go and say, well, we're gonna go to this IP integrator in here and we're gonna do create block design and I'm gonna say whatever the name is, design one. Okay, it's gonna walk me or it's gonna create some sort of a blank canvas for me and I can draw my circuit over there. So how do I draw that? Well, let me just uh, expand this. I can go in here and I tell it like, oh, well, okay, I want, um, I want a bunch of these. Uh, let me just see if you can, if you guys can see it in here. So let me repeat. We we'll create this plus in here, and I can figure out whatever whatever circuit part that I want in here. For example, maybe I need a micro blaze um, process microcontroller. For example, you can do this in here, and it'll just do that for me. And it'll just basically place it on the canvas in here. I can double click on it, figure out what I want to do with it, like the different memory sizes and whatnot. This isn't what we will be doing, but Vivado and most cat tools allow you to do this. And the reason why we're not going to do it is because it's tedious. It can get really big. And if I'm just going to connect wires and whatnot, it's you're just going to you're just going to make some mistakes. Viva so I'm showing you a very simple example, but please note that you can actually do something really, really complicated. So I'm, I have in here um, opened a different design and that design is a lot more complicated than a multiplexer. It's actually really big. And as you can see, I'm showing you the schematic. Vivado allows me to create all of these parts and connect them. But as you can see, it's really tedious and chances are you're going to make a mistake or two on doing this. And the other thing is, if you want to explain why you're connecting this to that, you're going to have to have a separate document doing this. And uh, doing that is really um, time consuming. So what we will be doing is actually we're just going to focus on a different way of entering um, a design or a design entry, which is a textual one. OK, so we're not going to be doing this here. We're just going to do a textual one. So what do I mean by a textual design entry? Well, let's do that. Well, in a textual design entry, um, you basically enter your design as text. So how do you do this? Well, you, you, here I'm showing you something it's called Verilog, but fr frankly speaking, what you need is a hardware description language or sometimes referred to as HDL. There are many, many hardware description languages out there, some proprietary, some standardized. Um, the two most commonly used ones or the ones that I, I'm very familiar with are Verilog, sometimes uh, System Verilog, and VHDL. 
And the reason why I'm focusing on these two only is because these two are maintained by IEEE. So there's an IEEE standards that describe Verilog and there's an IEEE standards that describe VHDL. So in parentheses in here, I'm putting system Verilog because Verilog and system Verilog used to be completely different standards and they used to do different things, but they got merged a few years back. So now um, whenever you're writing system Verilog or Verilog, you're pretty much are in the same standard in IEEE. But anyway, the focus in this course is going to be about writing code in Verilog. And really, the choice of the language is not very, very important. Um, if you learn one, you'll be able to switch to the other. For example, we're going to be learning Verilog. You can really easily switch to VHDL if you understand the basic concepts of how the design is working, how the implementation. This is just a way to describe your design, and we're just going to use Verilog. So why do we choose Verilog? Well, uh, if you take a look at the code in here, take a look at that line, for example. I know I told you do not worry too much about it, but chances are you can read it. And uh, you can read it because it, it models C. It's actually modeled on C. You're not writing C code. This has nothing to do with C. It just Verilog looks similar to C, and that's why we chose it, because you're kind of familiar to it. Okay. So the multiplexer example in here tells me, well, you have an and here and an or here and a not and so forth. Like you're familiar and you can read that code. Okay. All right. So a cat tool now, we know that after the design, you can, um, after you do your design, you can actually enter it either schema using schematic and you just draw it or using Verilog. We're just going to focus on the Verilog in this course. Um, we're not going to do schematic. You can do something small with the schematic, but chance are I won't want you to do that. Okay. So now the rest of the steps are pretty automatic. They're actually do, done by the CAD tool. That's why we use these tools because we want them to do the rest of the steps here in the flowchart. So all you have to do is just design, write code. That's what this course is all about. Again, it's two, two steps, design and implementation. And implementation is using Verilog. So I'm gonna describe that design using Verilog in here. But uh, I found out that um, it's probably very useful at least to have an idea of what the CAD tool is doing underneath, okay? In the course, what you will do, what you will be doing is actually you're going to be writing code and then you're going to go in here and you're going to just um, click uh, generate bit, bit stream and it will go through all of these steps you see here, most of them at least, um, all of the steps in here. But I'm just going to, in this lecture, I'm just going to walk you through all the steps one by one. So let's talk about the synthesis and uh, I'm going to close this IP integrator. We're going to talk about the simulation and the RTL analysis later. So the synthesis, it's actually this, the synthesis is the very first step in here as according to the flowchart. It takes your Verilog input and it synthesizes it. So what does it actually do? Well, a synthesis um, is the step of translating your Verilog code, the textual code into actual logic circuit. And the output of this synthesis step is actually a netlist, similar to what you see in a PSPICE or something like that. Okay, so you run the synthesis here. Okay, you can click on it. I already ran it. It takes some time to actually do that because it's a, it's a CAD tool, it's a numerical tool. So it takes some time to actually run all of these steps. So I ran it in here, but I can actually open the synthesis and do that. But before I actually open it and show you what's in it, I just want you to see what's it actually doing. So what does the synthesis do? Well, the synthesis step actually do, go through um, these steps in here. So what are these steps? So the first step is actually net list generation. What it does, it actually takes that code that you see in here and make sure that there are no errors in it whatsoever. So there are no missing semicolon, for example, or um, the syntax is correct, kind of like what a compiler gives you in C, it gives, it throws at you all these error messages. Once everything is corrected, it generates what we call a netlist. So you take that here, it generates the very initial netlist in here, okay? And then netlist is just a description of the different gates or the different circuit elements. It doesn't have to be gates, it could be adders, flip-flops, whatever it is that you're describing in Verilog. Okay, it just carries out, the, well, this gate is connected to this flip-flops and whatnot, and it's just textual way to do that. So the next step in the synthesis, and this is what makes CAD tools great, is actually um, gate optimization. So in a digital logic course, you probably have uh, done something like a K-map or you did some uh, Boolean expression reduction and whatnot. You did it by hand. You don't have to do that here anymore. Okay, the CAD tool actually does it for you. So the gate optimization takes the netlist as an input and generate a different netlist. Okay, but it's more optimized netlist. Okay, so it's an optimized netlist. Well, by optimized meaning 
I probably misspelled it in here, but an optimized uh, netlist tells me that um, it's the same functionality of the original circuit. So the circuit that is actually implemented by this netlist is the same as the circuit implemented by this netlist. The difference between them is a little bit more optimum. And optimum uh, depends, the meaning of optimum depends on what you, what you want. So, and if, let me open this in here and you will see that in the synthesis step, it actually have a constraint wizard. If you actually click on it, it'll walk you through different constraints. So as it turns out, you can actually constrain your design. I wanted to use a certain number of gates, uh, this blah, 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 blah. There's actually so, all, so many constraints that you can do it. So the optimization step, its purpose is to take the initial, uh, the initial interpretation and just optimize it based on the constraints you put. Okay, the number of gates has to be least or uh, the timing has to be so forth and, and so forth. Okay, and then we take these net list and we say, okay, well, uh, we need to map it to a certain technology. What do I mean by mapping it to a technology? Well, Verilog is not very specific to FPGAs. You can actually use it to do custom logic or you can even use it with different PLDs. So because we're doing, uh, we're actually implementing it on an FPGA. We need to, and we need to modify these uh, this netlist a little bit so that it, it it conforms to the target device that we want to put the design on. And our target device is actually an FPGA in this case. And in here, I'm showing you just a bird's eye view of an FPGA. An FPGA is a much much more complicated, but this is just a general a general overview of what it can um, do or how it's designed. Remember, an FPGA is just a blank canvas that you can do whatever you want with it. So what does that canvas gives you? Well, its basic components are logic cells, okay? What's a logic cell? So an FPGA contains thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of logic cells. So what's a logic cell? What internally, it has a bunch of components. So the first one is a lookup table. And what I'm showing you in here is the Arctic 7. The Arctic 7 is what we're using because this is the one that is, exists on the FPGA development board that we're using. So in an Arctic 7, it contains a lookup table that contains six inputs. I think there's one missing in here. That's fine, I'll just add it by hand. So six input lookup tables and one output. What's a lookup table? Well, a lookup table is just a truth table. You can think about it that way, okay? It's just a truth table. It implements a truth table. In turn, it has ANDs and OR gates and OR all in NAND gates. But anyway, for now, I just want you to know it's basically just a truth table, kind of like what you did. You have one input like A, B, C, D, E, and so forth, and you have like one function output in here. So technically, you can implement a um, combinational circuit using this lookup table, a combination of circuit that can take six inputs. Of course, Vivari and, 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 and Xilinx allows you to use this lookup tables as two lookup tables. Each one of them is actually five. But anyway, that's beside the point. The point is it, it contains a logic cell that can take six inputs and generates one output. And the logic cell also contains a couple of flip-flops. So there's two flip-flops in here. Okay, not one, but two flip-flops, at least in the Arctic 7. I mean, different FPGA families or different FPGA uh, technologies might contain the, the logic cell might look a little bit different but the bottom line it gives me some flip-flops why because you might want to implement sequential circuits and you know in a sequential circuit you need some sort of a storage element so it gives me a couple of flip-flops to do that and of course at the very end in here what the FPGA tells me in a logic cell you can you can route the output from the lookup table so you have completely combinational circuit or you can route it from the flip-flop so you have a sequential circuit so we have thousands of these logic cells and the CAD tool actually takes this net list that we just generated and tries to map it to utilize these logic cells. Let's assume that it wants a couple of lookup tables. So it tells me, well, I mean, I'm gonna use this logic cell and this logic cell and I'm gonna connect them somehow. So as it turns out, you need some sort of a way to connect these logic cells because they're implementing the same system and there are programmable interconnect between these logic cells and these programmable are programmable switches that connect the output from here to the input from here and so forth. And that's what the synthesis does. So what the synthesis does, it takes a Verilog code in here. So I'm gonna just say, this is very Verilog input in here. Okay, it generates a netlist, make sure that everything's correct, optimize it based on certain constraints, and then does the technology mapping in here based on the target device, okay? Before I go back to what Vivado is doing and showing you all sorts of fun stuff in here, um, why don't I just um, show you what, uh, what Xilinx at least have here? So Xilinx nomenclature, uh, you, you might or might not see a logic cell word, but you will see in, in Xilinx, it takes every four logic cells and calls them a slice, and every two slices calls them a configurable logic block or CLD. 
Why am I saying this? Because when we are in Vivado, you might see like, oh, the number of slices or the number of configurable logic blocks is blah, blah, blah. That how, this is how much I used, okay? This is what Dynix calls it. Different manufacturers will call it differently. The base functionality, again, it has logic cells at the bottom. So this table is, is taken from this particular data sheet in here, and it shows me the RTX 7 is a family. So there are different FPGAs within the same family with different capacities. Um, so some of the most common um, Xilinx dev boards that we use are the Basis or the Nexus A7 or Nexus A7. So I recommended the A7100T, which is this one in here. And the reason why is because it contains 15,850 slices. So again, a slice contains four logic cells. So you have to multiply that by four and you'll know how many lookup, lookup, lookup tables we have. Well, technically, I mean, it's available to us here. We have 6,300 63,400 lookup tables available to us. That's a large number. And not only this, because each one of them contains two flip-flops, I have 126,800 um, flip-flops available on that particular family. If you opt out to buy the 50T, you'll see that the capacity is a lot less. So you have 65,000 flip-flops and the lookup tables are only 32. Okay, so it's, it's um, less capacity, less logical capacity and so forth. All right. So let's uh, let's go back to this diagram in here again. So we have the synthesis. So I have ran that synthesis in here and I can show you what's happening. Let me just go to Vivado again. So I ran the synthesis in here and uh, we can see oh, how did it implement it. So the synthesis, you can actually open the synthesis design. You can say open design. Let me show you all of it here. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to show you what's happening here. It's opening it up. And again, this is pretty simple. So what it did, it says, well, these are because they're I0 and I1, they're input. So it used an input buffer and used some output buffer for the output. But frankly speaking, it used a lookup table to implement it because it's a combination of circuits. So it's using LUT3 or whatnot. Okay, that's what the synthesis did. So the output of that synthesis is there. Can you do something about it? Yes. Or can you actually change it? Yes. You can go to the timing constraint. You can edit it in here. You can just go and uh, rerun the synthesis or do whatever we want with it. But for, ten, for now, I just want you to know what it did. It took my Verilog code, this one here, and generated some sort of a net list that looks like that. Okay. That's what it generated. Okay. So what's the next step in, in this diagram? Well, the next step in the diagram, as you can see in here is actually, or here is functional simulation. Well, as it turns out, there are different simulations that you can run in Vivado. Okay, again, this this diagram is generic, but in general, like if you go to Vivado, you you will see that we have different um, uh, different simulations here or available simulations to us. Okay. Okay. So the simulations available to us, if you actually click on Run Simulation, you'll see that there is a behavioral simulation, there's a post synthesis functional, and there's timing one. And there's post implementation and the so we talked about the synthesis or this implement there's implementation there's some synthesis it's coming next the synth the implementation is after the synthesis step but anyway i just want to talk a little bit about the simulation so the behavioral it's actually the quickest and this is what we will be using so what is the simulation does well if you take a look at your code in here i'm just going to close that in here okay so if you take a look at um, my code in here well i'm intended uh, i intended to be a multiplexer but is it a multiplexer well, what I need to do is I need to actually run some sort of a simulation and there's a bunch of ways to do that. I can run the simulation directly here, which is just a behavioral simulation. It takes that and, and runs the behavioral and that's what we do. Uh, this is does not ha has nothing to do with the netlist that we just generated or, or anything else. It's just I'm going to take my code and I'm going to simulate its behavioral to make sure that it's functionally correct. And I have went ahead and I wrote some sort of a, what we call a test bench in here. And that's a test bench. We we're going to walk you through this test bench later, but for now, I'm just going to run that simulation just to show you what it's actually doing. Um, okay. So the simulation, um, does the following. And again, it's like cat tools sometimes are, are slower than what we would like them to do, but again, uh, they're necessary. Okay. So we run the simulation what does the simulation do? Well, the simulation does the following. Okay. So the simulation, because I, the simulation just takes your code. I'm generating a bunch of inputs in the I zero and I one and S this is the selector. This is the input zero, this is input one, and this is the output. And based on the value of this S I'm either uh, routing I zero or I one. It's a multiplexer again. Okay. So let's take a look at that. Well, uh, I have this S in here and S is zero. That means I'm outputting whatever is on I zero. And you can see that this is the output in here. That's uh, zero in here. This is zero in here. Um, it's one in here. It's one in here. It's actually mimicking it. And, but at some point I'm switching the S to one 
and I'm flipping it basically to output whatever is on I1 in here. And you can see the output in here is actually outputting one and one and so forth. And you can you can take a look at it and you can pause the video and just take a look at it. Um, if you run the simulation on your own, you probably won't see these colors. I've modified them for educational purposes. But anyway, they're usually all green or a little bit of red and blue. You'll see them throughout the semester. But the bottom line is I ran a simulation just to make sure that the multiplexer is operating exactly how I intended it to be. And it does based on my behavioral simulation. And again, the behavioral simulation is based on just this code, not on the um, not on the synthesized version. If you want the synthesized version, you need to go in here and write some sort of a code and it will just basically take that netlist and, and test it on the functionality of that netlist, which is a completely different thing. So this topic is beyond the beyond the scope of the course, but I just want you to know that people actually spend some time. Actually, most of the time in the design is actually in the in the simulation and the verification that your your circuit is actually functioning appropriately again with timing, which we're going to be talking about it shortly. Okay, so going back to um, the diagram to see what's the next step. The next step is in the process is actually after we figure out the functional, I test that my circuit is working correctly, the design is correct, I'll go in here. If it's not correct, I go in and, and I change it till it's correct. So we'll go to the physical design. What do I mean by the physical design? Well, it's the actually the implementation step. So let me show you what's happening in here, which is that particular part here on Vivado, the implementation step. So what's happening? Well, uh, similar to what happened in the synthesis, I am taking the net list from the net, the net list that the synthesis step actually generated, and I'm gonna do placement and routing and then static timing analysis. And frankly speaking, the implementation is mostly placement and routing. That's what we care about. So what do I mean by placement and routing? Well, the net list tells me, well, you need, let's say it, it tells me that you need, well, in our case, because it's really simple, it told me, well, you need one lookup table, okay? But much more complicated designs or circuits, it might contain a lot more, maybe thousands of these lookup tables or log lookup tables. So I know that I need certain logic cells and whatnot. So the implementation step will take it and will tell me, okay, so you need one lookup table or maybe 500 lookup tables. I'm gonna take a look at my FPGA and I'm gonna say, well, okay, I'm gonna choose this one, this one, and this one, and maybe this one and so forth, depending on how many of them. And this is what placement is, okay? So wherever I'm placing these lookup tables, I have thousands of them available, the tool will choose. And how does it choose? Well, um, it has an algorithm in it. It's actually a numerical iterative algorithm. And why is that? Well, I'm just gonna give you a very simple example. Let's assume that my netlist generated, let me just write this here in red. Let's assume that my netlist generated N elements, okay? And I really have an FPGA that can give me or that can contain all of them and not more, okay? So I have N logic cells that I want to use and FPJ gives me n logic cells. So how many ways can I actually place the different elements n in these? Well, meaning I'm saying like in this example, for example, I have one, two, three, one, two, three, I have nine. Let's assume that my netlist told me I have nine and I have nine available to me on the FPJ. So how many ways can I place these nines that gener got generated into these nine spots? And this is based on counting theory. This is nine permutation, which is nine factorial. And if you calculate that number, it's a pretty large number, even for only nine elements. So you can only imagine when it's actually thousands of them. So the placement is actually a really difficult problem to do, okay? Because you're gonna have to figure out where to do it. So with the, um, there's a lot of research that went into into designing this CAD tool and whatnot. And that's why we, again, that's why we use it. It generates a net list and then figure out which one of these logic cells it needs to use. So it uses all the different logic cells and uh, and connect and and just uh and it iterates so it might change it like maybe the next iteration it will change it till it's actually optimal based on certain constraint and not only does it do placement also because let's assume that you did use this logic cell and this logic cell and you need to actually connect it somehow well the connection need to happen somehow so the routing actually tells me well you're going to go through this one here this one here and this one here so i went through let's say three different interconnect is there a better way to do it maybe or a faster way to do it or maybe it contains like certain delays because remember all of these are physical electrons that have to move between the different logic cells so the further away they are apart the more delays you're gonna and more timing issues you're gonna have so you, i might have lost some of you in here but what i really want you to get from that is the following the implementation step does the following it takes a net list and it tries to map it to the fpga somehow so it tries to figure out the floor plan or which which logic cell should i should i use and it tries to figure out how that routing does and it does it over and over and over again in an iterative algorithm 
And eventually the outcome of that will be something similar to what you see in here, okay? So this one here is not my multiplexer um, option because it's it's more. So all of these highlighted ones are logic cells I've used, okay, which are thousands of them. And anything that you see is dark is I did not use any of them. Okay, so if, um, the outcome of the implementation is like, okay, I want to use these 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 logic cells and I want to route them. If you leave the if you leave the tool without any constraint, it's probably the easiest way. But sometimes you can actually constrain the tool to just use this particular part of the FPGA for some reason or another. Okay, so let's take a look at the implementation, how the Vivado actually does that. Well, in Vivado, you'll see I'm going to open the implementation. Okay, and uh, that's fine. We're going to do this in here. Okay, so now this is what the implementation did. It gave me the floor plan. And if you take a look at it, it just uses probably this one is the lookup table. Maybe it's somewhere. I mean, I can I can look up where that lookup table it used somewhere, maybe here or somewhere. These are actually the inputs and output buffers. But anyway, you, you get the idea. There's uh, maybe this one here, like you get like it, you can go and dig deeper. Oh, there you go. That's the lookup table it used. It just used this one. Or actually, this is the output buffer. So it's not that one. But anyway, you can you can go and figure out where it is, but that's that's basically it. And in the implementation, I can also run a bunch of reports in here. So not only can I do also constraint, kind of like what I did with the synthesis for, and the constraints are actually more important because maybe I want to uh, basically just squeeze everything in here just because it's faster because I don't want it to use I don't want it to create like really long route between the two uh, two two logic cells or whatnot. You can actually generate a bunch of reports in here. You can do timing reports. You can actually do utilization report. For example, if I click on the utilization report in here, it tells me exactly how many logic blocks I use. For example, in here, I'm, it tells me, well, you used one slice, okay? And you have 63,000 available, look, or slice lookup table, okay? I remember it's like the difference between slices and, and slice. Um, a slice is actually four, so I can forget, well, you get the idea, uh, but it tells me you used one lookup table out of 63 available. Okay, and if you have flip flops or whatnot, it gives you all different um, utilization reports in here. Okay, so now we go back to that diagram. So in the diagram, we went in here and now we figured out what the physical design is. Okay, that's the implementation, it generated it. I didn't talk too much about the static timing analysis, the one that you see in here. Uh, what the static timing analysis is, it tells me, it gives me all sorts of reports, like the same reports that you see, the utilization report, I can figure out the timing report in here. And it tells me, well, uh, the maximum delay between this part and this part is this much and so forth. We're going to get to that when we talk about timing. But anyway, um, the, going back to the diagram, the, I can do some timing simulation and actually just simulate just to make sure that my timing is important. And timing is important because uh, when you design digital circuits, um, you need to operate at, the diff at a certain speed. If you have some sort of a long path is in it, you might not be able to achieve that speed. Let's assume that you want to design a circuit that operates at 200 hertz, but because of the way that it got placed and routed, it can only operate at 150 hertz. That's actually much slower. So you can actually deal with the timing simulation in here just to make sure that this is functioning. Where did the delays come from? Well, again, we're dealing with physical elements. So there are delays in the electrons and how it moves and the wires and the logic cells and whatnot. We're not gonna worry too much about it now, but we're gonna see, well, timing simulation and it actually, the timing requirements have been met. Now we do the chip configuration. And in Vivado, this is actually generated in Bitstream, okay? So in Vivado, you generate that Bitstream. And frankly speaking, if you click on generate Bitstream in here, Okay, if you click on that and you just like, of course, you, I'm going to have to um, respond to all these messages and whatnot, but this is what I've done in here. If you generate, if you click on generate bitstream, it goes through all sorts of, uh, it goes through the synthesis and the implementation step and the generate bitstream. So what is the generate bitstream? Well, the generate bitstream, it'll take that placed and routed um, uh, code or net list that you generated and it'll just generate a single file that has a bunch of ones and zeros. It's a binary. You can think about it as an executable. It's not executable because you put it down the FPGA. It's a bunch of ones and zeros that tells it, well, this logic cell has to be activated. This logic cell has not to be activated and so forth. And you upload it to the board. So let me show you how it's actually done on the board. I went ahead and uh, I connected my FPGA board to the computer using this USB cable and I turned it on in here and it loaded the default program. Yours might not have this particular default program that shows you all sorts of colors, but that's not the point in here. The point is I wanna upload this particular program that we have seen or which is a multiplexer into that board. So how do I do that? 
Well, the way I do it is again, you usually, after you write the code, you go through the synthesis implementation and then generating bitstream, you just have to upload it. If you click on the generate bitstream, it'll go through the synthesis and the implementation and it will do everything. Uh, I've already done that because it takes some time. Um, all I have to do is just open the hardware manager in here and then go in here and say open target because I've figured, I have configured my Vivado correctly so it knows my FPGA, so I'm gonna say auto connect. Um, and it's just now connecting to the FPGA and just making sure everything is fine. And once it, once it is, it will just show me um, the message which is here, which is program device. And in the program device, as you might see, uh, it contains uh, this particular path. And this path actually takes me all the way to a bit file. And that bit file is just, if you open it, it's just a bunch of ones and zeros that gets uploaded to the FPGA memory. Okay, and then we click program and in the program, I'm just basically uploading through the USB cable to my FPGA. So if you take a look at my FPGA, it, it seems to be it's off. It actually is not off. Um, it just over overwrote that default program and put my multiplexer code on it. And the multiplexer code in here is actually, I can test it with these particular switches because this is how I set it up. Um, there's a way to do that. We'll, we'll walk through it later. But for now, I'm just gonna show you that it's actually functioning correctly. And the way we do it is the following. So what I have is I have this particular switch, which is the very first one, is actually the selector. And the uh, this is I0 and this is I1. And this little tiny LED in here actually outputs whatever I want. This is my output F, okay? So currently the selector uh, is at location zero. So it should take whatever I put on I0 will be on the LED. So if I take that LED up or the switch up, I'm gonna see that the LED is down. If I take it down, you're gonna see that it's down. It doesn't matter what I do on the I1 because the multiplexer is not routing that to the output. However, if I switch this all the way up here, now I'm switching, I'm, I'm routing whatever is on this switch to this LED. So whatever I do on the first one, nothing happens. On the second one, you're gonna see one, zero, one, zero. So my multiplexer is working properly. And these are the steps involved in actually going all the way from the design all the way to implementing it on the FPGA. The design in this particular case was very straightforward and simple. It's just a multiplexer. Uh, I don't want you to worry about writing the code yet. Um, starting next week, we're gonna, I'm gonna walk you through these steps. Actually, throughout the semester, all we're gonna do is just walk you through how to write Verilog code to actually implement certain circuits or more complicated circuits, more complicated than this one.